This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. everybody and welcome back to our amazing podcast. Hi Tanya. Hi Talia. Hi everyone. How is your day going so far? It is fantastic. I want to talk to you a brief second about our gruesome scale we had mentioned in previous podcasts. That scale is very high for this episode. Oh no is it? It's gonna be like a nine. (gasps) I am going to share with our listeners a story of a serial killer that I have never heard of before and could barely find any information besides a book that's no longer in print, even though the story's not that old. The book is called Charmer by Jack Olson. I used that for my information because it had everything I really needed. There was one more book I found that had a little bit of information on this serial killer. It is by Robert Keppel. He worked on Ted Bundy. It's called Serial Violence. And it's actually a forensic investigation textbook. So it had a lot of pictures in it that I really never expected to see in my life. Anyway, that's where I got the info from. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Like Spongebob. Please stop. (laughs) Take it down a notch. Take it down a notch. (laughs) This serial killer lived in Bellevue, Washington, which is a high-tech suburb of Seattle. And the story takes place in 1990, which is when Seattle was just on the cusp of grunge, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden. And it's also where we have the tech gurus... It was very hipster before hipster was even hipster. Bellevue, Washington, from 1980 to 1990, averaged about one murder a year. But that all changed in the summer of 1990. On Saturday morning, June 23rd, in the year 1990, at around 7.30 in the morning, one poor McDonald's worker stepped outside to the parking lot area of the McDonald's. And this area is kind of like in the back of maybe like a strip mall. It It's a parking lot that is shared with other businesses. He went to go towards the dumpster to sweep up the trash from the night before when near the dumpster, he saw a body. This dumpster is one of those that has a fence around it, but the fence only covers three-fourths of the perimeter. And then it's got the area that's open to go in and dump the trash. It also has a trash compactor, so you can press a button and it'll squish the trash down. However, this body was not put in the trash dumpster. It was actually strategically placed in the open area completely exposed to anybody going by. And this is a really busy parking lot. One of the businesses that used the trash dumpster was called Black Angus, which was a nightclub. What the McDonald's worker saw completely and utterly freaked him out. He ran back inside and 911 was called. When the police arrived, they saw the following. There was a female, clearly deceased, completely nude, laying on her back. She had been posed. Her left foot crossed over her right ankle, and her hands were placed on her abdomen, almost like someone in a coffin would be. Her head was turned to the left, and there was a clear circular top of a Frito-Lay dip container. You know, Frito-Lay chip. Yep, absolutely. 
was placed on her eye, intentionally. Inside one of her hands was a pine cone. The only items on her body was a gold choker chain and a gold watch. There was a pile of debris that had been swept up about three feet from her body, and two brooms were placed on the trash dumpster. There's also a, several blood stains and drag marks, so it appeared as if the body had been dragged at least 20 feet. And the deceased female had bright pink nail polish on, and you could see little flecks of the nail polish, probably from when she'd been dragged, that had scraped off her nails. It appeared from the scene that the perpetrator had probably originally planned on putting her body in the dumpster, but the woman was five foot seven, 150 pounds, and police surmised that maybe this guy just couldn't. So for whatever reason, instead of putting her in the dumpster, he deliberately posed her and exposed her. An autopsy examination showed the following. The victim had suffered severe blows to her right eye, her nose, her mouth, and her head. Her skull was so fractured that her head was quote-unquote lopsided. This girl had put up a fight. She had a ton of defensive wounds all over her. And the police believe that whoever did this to her had some bruises. And he was definitely covered with her blood. Her liver was lacerated as a result of a severe kick to her abdomen. It pressed it against her spine so much it split. Her eventual cause of death was strangulation from her own choker. The murderer choked her with her gold chain. She also had scratches on her neck, which were most likely from her fingernails, trying to stop him from choking her with the gold chain. The medical examiner determined that she had died sometime between 2.30 a.m. and 5.20 a.m. the previous night. They found no food in her stomach, and her alcohol level was 0.14. There was sperm found inside her. She had been raped with an object after death, that caused serious cuts, both anally and vaginally. He's a necrophiliac. Because of the posing of the body, the overkill, and the fact that he raped her after death, the police believed this was probably not your typical date rape. That's a good assumption. I think that's fair. Yes. I think that's fair. And that he was probably a sadistic killer. They also found traces of dirt and foliage on her body, so they knew that she had been killed elsewhere. The killer was extremely brazen because he placed her body between 2.30 and 5.20 a.m. behind a bar. Did anybody see this happen? No, there were no witnesses, and it took a few days to even figure out who the victim was. While the police were trying to find out who Jane Doe was, a young woman named Teresa arrived home at her apartment on Sunday, two days after the murder, and found her roommate's alarm clock going off. And also noticed that the cats hadn't been fed. Teresa had left Friday morning to go camping with her boyfriend. And her roommate, whose name was Mary Ann, told her that that night she might go to a nightclub called Papagayo's Cantina. Teresa hadn't seen or talked to Mary Ann since Friday morning. Mary Ann was described by... Teresa as being 27 years old, about 5 foot 7, 150 pounds. Marianne liked to go to clubs, she liked to drink, and she liked to smoke. She was a party girl. According to her roommate, Marianne didn't like sex. She actually referred to her as asexual. 
and she hadn't had a boyfriend in a very long time. Marianne came from a religious family, and she had told her sister that she hadn't had sex in seven years. Seven years? Seven years. Seven years, girl. She must really not like sex. Yeah, really (laughs) not like sex. She used to wear on her lapel a pin that said, quote, I can read your mind. No. (laughs) End quote. She was shutting it down before it started. (laughs) Yeah, she really didn't like sex. The club that Marianne told Teresa that she was going to go to, Papagayo's Cantina, was a popular singles bar, and it was about one mile away from the Black Angus, which is the bar located by the dumpster. Teresa was concerned about where Marianne is, because Marianne was considered very responsible. She liked to party hard, but she was really responsible. She was going to school to be a computer scientist or an IT specialist. And it wasn't like Marianne to let the cats go hungry. Teresa knew that Marianne often would go home on Sundays to visit her parents and go to church with them. So Teresa just kind of let things go and didn't let her imagination get the best of her. In addition, she didn't want to call up Marianne's parents and get them alarmed if Marianne had decided to go home with a guy. Marianne did have a history of going home with men. She just wouldn't sleep with them. (laughs) Marianne had a definitive history of going home with strange men at clubs and refusing to have sex with them. Teresa didn't want to worry Marianne's parents because Marianne's parents didn't know she drank, didn't know she smoked, didn't know she was a party girl. So she just kind of let things go until Tuesday came around. Teresa called Marianne's parents and found out that Marianne never showed up Sunday for church. And they immediately called the police and reported her missing. Teresa drove over to Papagayo's Cantina. And remember, this is Tuesday. This is almost four days since the body was found. In the parking lot, she saw Marianne's black Camaro sitting there. That's when she completely freaked the fuck out. When the police got to the parking lot, they looked inside the Camaro. And Marianne had some buttons pinned to her headliner. I really love this button. It says, you do the thinking, I'll do the drinking. (laughs) That's a good one. She had another one that said, I like you, can I lick your face? Then there was one more. (laughs) This one I liked too. It said, what's your problem, dick face? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I like Marianne. Yeah, me too. She probably was a fun person. Four days after the discovery of the body, on June 27th, 1990, Marianne was identified through dental records. During their investigation, the police found out an employee from Black Ingus left at 3.15 a.m., and when he left and walked into the parking lot, there was no body. So she had to have been placed sometime after 3.15 a.m. What time was she found? 7.30 a.m. In the Papagayo's cantina, lost and found, was Marianne's black purse and also a yellow sweater that an employee had found on the back of a chair that had been left there, and that was Marianne's. In interviewing patrons of the bar, she was described as a Peter tease. (laughs) Marianne. Again, she liked to go home with strangers, but she would refuse to have sex with them. She liked to draw attention to herself at the clubs, and she drank a lot there. People told the police that Marianne would basically go outside and smoke cigarettes with just about anybody, and she was deemed to be too trusting. On the night she was murdered, she fell down, so she was drunk. And she asked the DJ over and over again to play you can't touch this (laughs) she asked him five times did he play it he played it twice for her and then he was like get the hell away from me he was like i cannot play it a third time he's the one that reported she fell down and that's when he was like get the hell away some people that were at the club that night said that they recall maybe something along the lines of her saying that she was drunk and that she needed a ride home And that's about 
the last anybody saw of Marianne. This was about a little after 10, Friday night. The police ended up with no strong leads in Marianne's case. Then, on August 9th, 1990, 47 days after Marianne's body was found, there were these three boys in Bellevue who were camping in their backyard. And about 4 a.m., they heard what was described as a howling scream. It stopped, and they didn't think anything more of it. About 8.30 in the morning, this 13-year-old girl named Kelly got up, and she tried to go into her mom's room. When she went to go in her mom's room, the door was locked, which was really unusual for her mom. Kelly walked around to the back of this two-bedroom ranch within the city limits of Bellevue. And she went to the sliding door that was in her mom's bedroom, and she found it open. She peeked inside, and she saw blood, so she freaked out, and she called her father, who was divorced from her mother. Her father came within 10 minutes. He went to the back. He peeked in and saw blood, and he called the police, and he reported a suicide. The police responded to what they thought would be a suicide, but what they found wasn't even close. One of the officers described how he got there and he saw the ex-husband, who immediately was not a suspect because he had cast on both of his arms from an accident at work. When the police officer walked into the bedroom, he knew right away it wasn't a suicide because there was a naked woman named Carol with a shotgun inserted five inches into her vagina holy hell what the fuck (laughs) that is what he said (laughs) i'm guessing (gasps) could you imagine he's pretty scarred they were all pretty scarred i'm scarred hearing about it i saw pictures because it was in the book serial violence and i'm scarred from it i did not anticipate seeing a crime scene like that so let me tell you what i saw and what the police saw Carol was naked except for red high heels on her feet. Her legs were sprawled out where her knees were wide apart, but her heels were touching. And placed on her ankles was a shotgun, which I stated was still in her vagina. Good! I can't believe I'm saying this stuff. I can't believe I'm saying this shit. This is definitely a nine on the gruesome scale. I told you it was gruesome. Her groin was exposed. Whoever killed her intended to shock the fuck out of people. A pillow was placed over her head, and at first the police officer thought that she had been smothered. After the police removed the pillow from her head, they noticed that a plastic bag from a dry cleaner had been really tightly wound around it. And they also noticed she had been hit 13 times with some sort of blunt instrument that left Y marks all over her head. It resembled a cattle prod. She'd been hit so hard that her ear was sliced off. She had a bite mark on her arm, blood was smeared everywhere, and her ribs were broken. Whoever killed her did overkill. She didn't need this much injury to die. Carol had only two defensive wounds. One was on each hand, which led the police to believe that the killer quickly subdued her. Carol made the mistake of leaving her sliding glass door propped open a little bit to let in some fresh summer air. Never leave your windows open, people. (sighs) Yes, you have said that many times. never. Never. Fresh summer air can fuck off. Mm Mm-hmm. My bedroom's on the second floor, and I don't even leave that window open. (laughs) My bedroom's on the third floor. I feel like I could probably (laughs) leave. I mean, someone would have to get a ladder. A big ladder. But um, I don't know anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know anymore. I know. I don't know. 
You think you're safe, but you're not. Nope. I'd rather be hot in my house <laughs> than be dead. As I stated, Carol had a daughter. Her name was Kelly. She was 13. She also had another daughter who was nine. She was divorced. She was a bartender. She was described as outgoing, flirtatious, and spirited. And a woman who liked to tan a lot. Enough words in a book to describe her. She must have tanned all the damn time. The police interviewed the 13-year-old girl that called her dad, Kelly. And Kelly told them what she knew. Kelly told police that around 4.30 the previous night, she heard someone walking down the hallway. She shared her room also with her little sister, and it was about 15 feet from her mom's room. So she sees someone walking down the hallway. She sees a silhouette of a man, and he's holding a yellow flashlight. Their family dog didn't bark, so she assumed it was her mom's boyfriend, Tom, and she went back to sleep. And whoever killed Carol went ahead and locked her door. So maybe he didn't want the daughters to find her. Maybe he did one nice thing. I doubt it. Probably not. Carol had kept silver coins in these purple crown royal bags. You know the purple crown royal bags that got the little tie? She would collect silver coins and keep them in her bedroom. And prior to her death, she complained to friends that she noticed small amounts had recently been stolen and that she thought maybe somebody was coming in and actually stealing a little just a little bit of money which she thought was odd she kept two guns under her bed and the gun that was used to sodomize her was actually her gun from under her bed friends described carol as always needing to have a man around we all have one of those friends we do gotta have a guy to feel happy Girl, you don't need a guy to feel happy. Just find happiness within. Yeah. And when you do, let me know how that goes (laughs) because I'm still trying. I'm working on it. I read a police report regarding Carol in which it stated that Carol was described as a sex addict. Neighbors complained they could hear her orgasm from across the street. Oh, my God. Across the street. Wow. (gasps) She was really into group sex. And she didn't have a gender preference. Get down with your bad self, Carol. Get down, get down. (laughs) She had two lesbian relationships in the past, but at the time of her death, she was seeing a guy named Tom. In the police report I talked about, there was something really fucked up that I just got to read to More fucked up than what you've already told me. Oh, yeah, this is, this is, I, I don't even know. You guys can... Decide for yourself how you feel about this. I'm just going to read it. It's going to have a couple blanks in it. And the blank is someone's name that told the police this. And the police redacted their name. It says, quote, Carol pestered blank into helping her fulfill a fantasy that she had of being home alone asleep at night and being made romantic love to by a stranger who broke into her home. Blank went to a bar and he talked a black man into fulfilling her dream, which the black man did. Blank got a black man to do it to make Carol upset since he knew she didn't like blacks. Carol went along with it so as to not offend the man. (laughs) What? (laughs) Okay. She asked someone to set up a rape fantasy. Yeah, rape fantasy. Wow. And this person, for whatever reason, purposely got a black man to do it because this person knew Carol didn't like African-American men. Carol doesn't want to offend the man, so she goes along with it. So he meets him in a bar? Yeah. And he's like, hey, go to my friend Carol's house? Yes. Break in? Mm. Pretend a raper. Wow. How do you feel about that? <laughs> Because <laughs> I, how do you think I feel about it? Felt confused. I'm, con- yes, confusion. Disturbed. Extremely disturbed. Not judging. No, I was just going to say, I'm not judging. <laughs> yes. I'm just, I'm judging. I don't know how to feel about it. It's not a good idea to ever do that, I'm no, guessing. especially, With a okay. stranger. To each their own. I guess. During their investigation, the police were able to put together Carol's last night alive. As I stated, she was a bartender. 
She came home from work about 7 o'clock and made dinner for her daughters. Then she read a book on scuba diving because her and Tom were going to go to the Caribbean for a few weeks. At about 9 o'clock, she called her mom, talked to her mom on the phone for a little bit. Around 12.30 a.m. when her daughters went to sleep, she met a former boyfriend of hers at a restaurant. And they hung out and drank pop until 2.15 a.m. One of her neighbors saw her pull into her house about 2.45 a.m. and saw her bedroom light go on. So she came home and went into her bedroom, turned on the light, probably went to sleep, and then was attacked. Police focused heavily on Carol's boyfriend, Tom. He was described as a businessman and a ladies' man. (laughs) (laughs) They had somewhat of a on-again, off-again, volatile relationship. Not that there was any violence, but a lot of arguing. Tom was very sensitive about his penis size. Apparently, she would use that against him when they were fighting. Carol. That's not nice. It's not nice. Carol found out that Tom was sleeping with another woman, which is kind of strange because from everything I've read, she was sleeping with other men, but she got really mad, and this other woman got really mad, and they talked about it. They decided to totally mess with Tom. They got a card that had pictures of bare butts. And they got some black roses. And they had it delivered to Tom's work. The card said, underneath the butts, you're the biggest asshole of all. (laughs) (laughs) And then they also wrote in the card, make me bigger, baby. Because apparently that was a line Tom often said. (laughs) Tom did have one arrest for a prior domestic violence, not with Carol and a DUI. And he was supposed to meet Carol at 6 a.m. to go tanning, but he never showed up. And that made police wonder, hmm, did he know she was dead? A little side note, why are you going tanning at 6 (laughs) a.m.? Who gets up at 6 a.m. to go tanning? And what tanning salon is open at 6 a.m.? I don't know, but her and her boyfriend were going to go together. Maybe he was at a gym. Maybe. Another thing that made police suspicious of Tom was that, quote, all of Carol's lovers showed up that day, but not Tom. I don't know how many lovers, I don't know how many lovers she had, but that made that, that made them suspicious. What showed up to her house? Yeah, to talk to the police. Oh, okay. Word got out. (laughs) I don't know. That's what they said. Except for Tom. Tom said that he was busy out on a date with another woman. When they actually got Tom in for questioning, he appeared drunk and started hyperventilating. He refused to take a polygraph. He had no alibi to offer, and he would not provide bite mark impressions. Then he mumbled something about maybe blacking out. Carol's house was two miles from the Black Angus, but police didn't believe the crimes were connected, even though they had two murders in 47 days within two miles. 21 days after Carol was found dead, a guy named Bob, he worked at the fire department in Bellevue. He got up at 5 a.m. to go jogging with his wife, and his dog started barking like a freak. When he looked out, he saw the silhouette of a man with a flashlight. The man took off, Bob chased after him, but the creeper got away. Bob went down to the basement because he and his wife had a basement apartment at their house. His tenant, Andrea, who they call Randy, seemed to be fine. She was still sleeping. She didn't wake from the commotion, which made Bob feel better because he knew about those other two prior killings. Bob called the police. The police came out. They looked around. They didn't see anything. But Bob didn't want to take any chances. So he spent the weekend putting up those motion detector lights And this is Labor Day weekend in 1990. There'd also been a string of cat burglaries in Bob's area, which is a very affluent neighborhood. So Bob didn't want to take any chances, especially with a young girl in his basement. On Monday, September 3rd of 1990, Bob's wife noticed a smell coming from the basement And she thought maybe one of Randy's two cats died. So she opened the basement door 
Then she started screaming. At 11.23 a.m. on Labor Day, 1990, 911 received a call. It was from Bob. Bob was breathing heavy. Bob was freaked out. Randy, their 24-year-old tenant, was dead. It had only been 24 days since Carol's murder. Randy, who's Caucasian, was laying on her back on her bed with a blanket pulled up to her chest and a pillow over her head. When the police looked at the crime scene, this is what they saw. They lifted up a pillow that had been placed over her head and an electric dildo was shoved in her mouth. Under her arm was a book placed called More Joy of Sex, part two of the book Joy of Sex. Her head was mutilated from a brutal beating and part of her brain was oozing out. She had scrapes down her back from either fingernails or a knife. She'd been stabbed in the rectal area three times and her legs were spread eagle. One positive note is it appears she was killed in her sleep. Oh, thank God. Thank Thank God. God. Because there were no defensive wounds. I learned a new term in studying this case. It's called piquerism. Have you heard of that? No, I haven't. How would you pronounce this? Piquerism? Yeah, I think. Maybe peak? Peak? Peakerism? I don't know. Pickerism, peakerism. I apologize to those with this fetish, but I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm going to tell you what peakerism, pickerism is. I really can't wait now. <laughs> I didn't know there was such a thing. <sighs> Sexual pleasure gained by stabbing, cutting, or slicing another person. Oh. I didn't know there was a name for it. I thought it was just sickism, derangement, and to each their own, but... Man, this is this is mutilation. But I'm I'm not judging. Yeah, I yeah, I'm not. <laughs> not. Randy's body had two hundred and thirty one small cuts slash pokes all over it, including the bottoms of her feet. These were not stabbing to kill. These were almost like an art. The murderer appeared to have played tic tac toe. On her chest. Oh, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. I think he won. (laughs) (gasps) Some of the wounds on her were straight lines, like pokes in a straight line, and others were patterns. One of the patterns that included 20 pokes was the shape of a hand on her thigh. You know what I think we need? A shameless plug. I haven't heard an infomercial of ours in a long time, and I think this might be a chance for us to take a little break. Regroup, because I need to regroup. Sounds like a plan. All right, guys, we'll be right back. Okay, we're back. Let me continue where I left off. Semen was found on the floor in multiple spots. Sexual intercourse did occur with her. After death, because he's a sick fuck. We have what is termed a repressive, sadistic necrophiliac. I'm going to teach you all another lesson, Tanya. It's a very important lesson. A repressive necrophiliac, that is a person that enjoys putting objects inside of people after death. (laughs) Talia's laughing because of the face I just made. (laughs) Oh, good God. Who knew there were names for such things? They occur enough that they have to have labels. Apparently. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Let me let me fan myself <laughs> off for a second. All right. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Sexual intercourse after death. There was no sign of forced entry in Randy's house, and there were no fingerprints on the crime scene. Police were able to determine by reviewing the phone messages and the phone recordings on Randy's answering machine that she'd definitely been dead before Friday at noon. All the knives were missing from her apartment, and also her amethyst ring was missing. 
Police figured out that the perpetrator entered her apartment through the garage door that had been left propped open so the cats could go in and out. Randy was described as a 24-year-old, dependable, hardworking woman. She loved the outdoors, jeeps, parties, beer, and show horses. She had a keychain that said, Bitch on wheels. (laughs) Randy had a best friend. Her name was Kathleen. Kathleen was delegated the unfortunate task of having to pick out funeral clothes for her best friend. That required Kathleen to go into Randy's apartment. Uh. Randy's mom showed up at the apartment with Kathleen, but the police said only Kathleen could go in because they didn't want to contaminate it. It, This was just, I thought, something very interesting. Kathleen said when she went into the apartment, first of all, she was horrified. There was missing carpet. There was blood everywhere. There was black dust from the fingerprinting. But what I thought was really interesting is when she actually went to pick out the clothes for her dead friend, she asked herself, do you get a bra and underwear? (laughs) That's a good question. I know. I thought, God, that is a good question. I don't know what the answer was. I don't know. (laughs) Police surmised that Randy went out on Thursday night with some friends. She went home alone. She went to bed. And she never woke up. Police wondered if maybe that call from Bob was a ruse to throw them off and maybe there was never any creeper running around his yard. They suspect Bob might be the killer. And it should be noted that Randy lived five miles away from the Black Angus. So now we have three murders within 67 days of each other in a five mile radius. The police decide to bring in the big guns and they brought in a criminal profiler who's very famous to all you true crime people, Robert Keppel. He helped work on the Green River Killer and Ted Bundy. They also called in the famous criminal profiler, John Douglas. Who wrote the book Mindhunter. Yes. Great book. You got it for me for Christmas last year. I did. Great book. The criminal profilers use a system called HITS, Homicide Investigation and Tracking System, HITS. It is a database filled with violent crimes, serious violent crimes, and murder. It's got rapes and homicides in the state of Washington and Oregon and also Canada. In 1990, in the HITS system, There were 2,115 murders. So basically, it was a system where if there was a murder, the police would put in interesting facts of the murder, and it was a database. Now, to compare, there are 6,000 murders in that database from the same area. The criminal profilers believe that Mary Ann's murder was more of an accident or an experiment. That's where he started figuring out what to do and not to do. They think he did originally try to rape her, and she resisted. And she was much stronger than he thought she would end up being. So he killed her. And once she was dead, he got a thrill from it. And raped her. And then they believe he was actually going to dispose of her body, but couldn't lift her. So he posed her and got really excited and maybe was even surprised how excited he got by it they think he learned a couple things like next time I do it I want to take my time I don't want to be in public so he started tweaking it and hence he went to Carol's house in the hits database the police entered the following three criteria posing of bodies insertion of objects in the body and leaving them there and displaying the body intentionally to be discovered. When they typed in those characteristics, they found no other murders in the hit system that matched. I could tell you a couple really interesting true crime facts of the hit system, if you have a second. Because I love learning about facts of true crime. Of the 2015 murders in the database, only six victims had been posed. I always thought there were more creepy people that posed than that, but I guess not. 
58% of the time, the bodies were left exactly as they had been when they died. Like, oh, I killed them. Shit, I'm out of here. 10% of the time, they were concealed. And 10% of the time, they were actually intentionally placed in the open. I don't know about the other 22%. There were 19 cases where objects were inserted in the victims. But only six where the object was left behind. It's a lovely topic for the day. (laughs) A profiler also came to the conclusion that the male was single, white, probably upper class, able to mix with the victims and not go noticed. 11 days after Randy's body had been found, which is four days after she was killed, on September 10th, 1990, around 3.30 in the morning, Sunday morning, a 16-year-old girl named Nicole had been out much too late and was coming home trying to get back into her parents' apartment when she found out that she was locked out. She tried to wake up her brother, Tony, by throwing rocks at his window and kind of yelling his name, Hey, Tony! But not too loud. When she was doing that, an African-American male approached her, and he said something along the lines of, Hey, you're Tony's sister? And he acted as if he knew Tony. He said he would help her get inside, and they checked a window. All of a sudden... She was thrown to the ground, and this guy stood over the top of her with a big rock and started smashing her head. She started screaming and begging him to stop, and he started dragging her body. She noticed some lights turning on, and then she lost consciousness. Her brother and her father heard her screams, and they ran outside, and they chased this creeper, but he got away. Nicole woke up 10 hours later in the hospital, She had a depressed skull fracture, bruises, scratches. She was able to describe to the police the guy who did it. He was about 5'9", scrawny. He was a light-skinned African-American. However, the police were not able to catch this guy. Then on Wednesday, a few days after the assault on Nicole, this girl named Tammy, blonde hair, blue-eyed, really pretty girl, She lived in the same apartment complex as Nicole. And she was, by the way, completely freaked out about the murders and what happened to Nicole. She had some friends over, and after they left, she decided, okay, I'm going to go to bed. She gets her pajamas on. She's in her bedroom. Then she hears a tapping sound on her bedroom window. It scared the shit out of her. She shut the light off in her bedroom, she got her cordless phone, and she crawled into the corner of her bedroom and called 911. While she was on the phone with 911, she heard scratching sounds on three different windows. The police arrived, and of course, no one was there. When they searched the parameter of her apartment, they noticed in her backyard that her Screen was removed from her sliding glass door. Oh, shit. She was so close to being the next victim. Tammy told the police she thought she knew who was doing this. It was a friend of hers named George. A week earlier, Tammy was at home with her roommate, and her roommate saw George peek through the window. George saw the roommate see him, so he kind of played it off and made it like a joke. And then he went around to, like, the other windows and, and started playing a game. Oh, yeah, that's hilarious. Oh, they did not think it was yeah. hilarious. <laughs> Her roommate actually called the police, and the police didn't really take it seriously because George is like, I'm just messing around. Tammy told the police, you need to arrest this guy ASAP. I'm going to die if you don't. George happened to live only four houses away from Tammy. Police went to talk to George, and George's roommates gave him an alibi. But Tammy's like, no, 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 no. You need to arrest this son of a bitch. George ended up having some outstanding warrants, so they went ahead and arrested him. Would you like to know about our repressive, sadistic, necrophiliac perpetrator? Sure. 
was going to say, there's only one right answer. Because <laughs> you're going to learn about him. I have no choice. You have no choice. I'm going to tell you all about a guy named George Russell. George Russell was born in Florida in 1958. His mother got pregnant with him when she was a freshman in college. His father was a really educated man. His mother was African-American. His father was British and American. After being married for about six months, his mom up and left. His father took George with her and basically went back to college and left George with grandma and aunts. George lived with his aunts and his grandma in West Palm Beach, Florida until he was six. He was showered with affection and doted on. He was never abused. He himself later describes his childhood as being great, no problems. His mom came back from when he was six after she completed college and had fallen in love with a dentist. When George was in sixth grade, his family up and moved to Mercer Island, Washington, which is an uppity, really rich, Caucasian area. Wealthy white people. In Washington, George's stepdad opened up his own dentistry and his mom was a professor at the college. She was well-respected and did lots of lectures. Eventually, she gave birth to George's half-sister, Erica, whom George absolutely adored. Erica ended up going to Yale and graduating. In his early teens, George started demonstrating behavioral problems. I think all teens have behavioral problems as a mother of of teens and as a person that used to be a teen. (laughs) He was taken to a therapist and he was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. I can be antisocial sometimes. Antisocial personality disorder means you have no conscience. Oh. That's a characteristic. They tend to commit crimes. They lack empathy, sympathy. They are very shallow. Not only was he diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, he also was determined to have an IQ of 180. He began borrowing things from friends without asking their permission or returning them. (laughs) He was stealing from school lockers. He got caught with some weed. He was described as a person you couldn't not like. Everybody liked George. Even though he would steal from his friends and they'd catch him in lies, people just liked him. He'd barbecue for him and make him feel good. He started hanging out in the police department when he was in his mid-teens and hanging out with the officers. He would even try to find out what crimes teens were doing and report them to the police. The police really loved having him there at the police department. And they kind of took him under their wings. But eventually he committed so many petty thefts and stuff that they were like, George, you gotta get the fuck out. <laughs> At the age of 16, his mom's marriage to his stepdad fell apart. And she moved his sister Erica all the way across the United States to Maine. George says he didn't want to move. Other people say his mom didn't want him to move with her. George ended up staying back and living with his stepdad in Mercer Island. Throughout his 20s, George never really had a home. He didn't have a job. He was one of those guys that literally had a backpack with all his stuff in it. And maybe you'd invite him to a party and he'd just never leave. Oh, Lord. One of those people. Literally. Be on your couch for weeks at a time. George didn't like African Americans. And he would only socialize with white people. It was described that if you were speaking to George without seeing him, you would think you were talking to a Caucasian male. And even though George had a high IQ, he didn't do well in school. Another quirk about George is he stayed up until about 6 a.m. every night, and then he would sleep all day. That was his usual sleep pattern. This made it perfect for him to be a cat burglar, which is what he did. He got caught stealing. So many times, and people often would be like, okay, I'm not going to press charges. It's George. As George got older, he didn't fit in with people his own age, so he continued to just hang out with teenagers. They were easy to control. He could buy them alcohol, and they thought he was super cool. By 1990, 
George had over 36 arrests. He still had no job. And he was living on the couch of four Caucasian girls who just graduated from high school's apartment. He went to one of the parties that they threw, and he literally never left. He convinced the girls that he was an undercover police officer. He would go around with a police hat and a scanner. Because that's really undercover. (laughs) That's a good point. They were young. Yeah. They could be manipulated. What was the scanner for? You see what's going on when the police might need him. Oh, like a police scanner. Okay. Yeah, it was a police scanner. After Marianne's murder, he brought home a poster that had some pictures of Marianne that the police had made that said help, and he taped it to the wall. He also cut out articles of the murders and taped them to the wall. The girls believed he was actually helping solve the murders. Surprise! Surprise! He was living with four people that were exactly his victim profile. He also told these very naive four girls that the dead women were skanky sluts that used men, and therefore he had no sympathy. As I stated, the police arrested George. From jail, George called his roommates and told them, the police are going to want to come and search your apartment. When they do, I want you to hand them this book. When the police came to the girl's apartment, they handed the police, the book George wanted them to give the police. It was a textbook on crime scene evidence. He was just taunting the police. George was a fanatic with crime scenes, solving murders. He was always reading books on this stuff, and he thought he was smarter than the police. George didn't know about a new thing that was coming out in the whole police world. DNA? DNA! George. I think you're so smart. I think you're so smart. You're not. Police found out that one of George's favorite places to go was Papagayo's Cantina. And coincidentally, he had been there on the same night that Marianne was killed. A part-time security guard's memory got jogged when he found out George was a suspect and remembered that around 11 o'clock on the night Marianne was killed, George was seen walking a wobbling, stumbling woman off to his friend's truck. And the reason why it stood out in the security guard's head was because George never really left with girls. He had this strange take on women. He talked about sex a lot. He had pornography in his duffel bag that he carried around. But he didn't really date a lot of women. When he left with a woman... It did stand out in the security guard's head. Police found George's friend's truck that he left in that night. And guess what they found in the truck? Blood. And the new DNA technology that they had just been working on determined it was Marianne's. George also had a connection with Randy. He had met Randy a few months earlier at a mutual friend's house. They were just partying, hanging out. A couple days later, Randy was at her apartment and somehow George found out where she lived and showed up. And she let him in. Then she called her friends, the mutual friends they had in common, and was like, you tell that motherfucker never to come to my house again. She did not like George. She was totally creeped out that he showed up at her house. Their mutual friends literally took George aside and said, you got to leave Randy alone. She also told her friends she thought George had stolen money. From her apartment when he was over there. Because he probably did. 50 bucks was missing. Sticky fingers. On the night that Randy was murdered, George tried to set up an alibi. He threw a party at a hotel room with a whole bunch of teenagers. And again, he's 32 years old. He bought all the weed, all the alcohol, and threw this big gig. George himself didn't really drink, but he made sure everybody else pretty much got shit-faced. Then around 3.30, he kind of just slipped out of the party. He came back at 6.30 with food. Police were able to link the semen in Marianne to George through DNA. They were also able to determine George's hair was found in Carol's underwear. And in the duffel bag that George carried around everywhere he went was one of Randy's hair. Keep in mind, DNA was in its infancy, so the prosecutors were concerned that If they tried each case individually, 
they might be too weak. So they tried all three cases together, and this was very controversial. The prosecutors had to call Robert Keppel and John Douglas, the criminal profilers, to testify about the HITS database to show that whoever killed Mary Ann, Randy, and Carol had to be the same person because it was just beyond coincidence. They didn't say it had to be George. They just testified it had to be the same person. The trial lasted 33 days, and George was convicted. He was sentenced to life without parole. George Russell is a very unique serial killer. He's one of the few African-American serial killers. And in addition, which makes him even more rare, is that he crossed race and he killed only Caucasian women. That's George Russell. I had never heard of him. I never heard of him either. He's so creepy you think he'd be in all the podcasts out there. I couldn't find hardly anything on him besides the two books that aren't even published anymore. That's it. That's the story, everyone. It's very disturbing. Well, thank you, Talia. You're welcome, Tanya. Thank you, everyone, for listening. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't know what to say. What do you say after you've just shared this with everybody? <laughs> You're so welcome. You guys are all so welcome. I know. I hope you have a great day. Yeah. I mean, how do you end this? I know. You just move on. We're going to move on. Well, I'm going to be okay. You're going to be okay. We're all going to be okay. How can everybody check us out? You can find us on social media, on Instagram and Facebook. You can find us on the web, tntcrimes.com. Yes, go there. We have other unreleased episodes. One of them is a gruesome score 10, we've determined. It was too gruesome to even share with you guys. It was bad. (laughs) Which, after this episode, you can tell, must be really bad. Yeah. (laughs) That's one Tanya did. It's great. And also, check out our member area if you would like to support us. Because we don't get paid. Because we don't get paid. But we'd like to. Thank you. Until next week. Thank you. Until next week. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.